Evans. The history of Camp Evans. So a lot of people come here to VCF and they're like, what is this place? They're like looking around, like, does there used to be a base or something? And so I'm like, I give a short answer. I'm like, I don't really have time. There's another guy here who can answer all these questions. He's like done a lot of research and he knows all the history. I'm like, because there's a lot of history here, um, different technologies and things like that. Um, so um, Fred, Hello. This, this is, is Fred, Fred Carr. Carr. Hello, everyone. Um, he was the director of InfoAge for about 25 years. And now he's currently at Princeton's physics department in Simon Observatory. And he's going to tell a little history about Camp Evans, where InfoAge has, now has the museums, and this is where BCF has its museum, and this is where broadcasting from. So the first question is, what is Camp Evans? All right. Let's go. I'm Who's going to share some slides? All right. Camp Evans is an amazing place with an incredible history that we can only touch on. But what makes Camp Evans great today is the amazing volunteers like VCF, like Jeff, like Corey, like Andy, who are saving history here so it can be interpreted for the future. And it's sort of fun because in the early days of computing work, Camp Evans had some involvement. So we're working to get the message through, through volunteers. And we had a lot of challenge to repair for education. So uh, let's, I'll tell them what InfoAge is. All right, okay? let's start with that. All right. So right now it's a series of museums. Here's one of our guides. And every year we, um, we uh, add to that. Okay. That's okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> oh, you're jumping around. Oh, sorry about that. That's all right, because uh, I, I want to do as much in the 30 minutes I have as possible. Okay. Thank you. So uh, notice the um, or orangish kind of roof building. Uh, that's the Marconi Hotel built in 1912. Okay. And so... But the place is, our third question. Why is it a national historic landmark? All right. Camp Evans is a national landmark for one reason out of all this history. And here are just some of the textbooks that have some Camp Evans history in it. And you see uh, the invention that changed the world. You see, um, satellites, communication in space, you see electronics, you see, um, oh geez, McCarthy, you see birth of information age, you see wireless days, you see secret weapons in World War II. The history is immense, but it is a national landmark for just World War II. Because you have to fit a theme to be a national landmark. And for many years, we, never fit a theme. And then Congress commissioned a six-year study of World War II and the American home front. And not only did we fit, but they said that this site should be considered for national landmark status. And we just took it from there. The national landmark was kind enough to give us a professional writer on their staff whose nickname was Dr. No. <laughs> and he had already told us no for once, but that's another story. Yeah. But then he said yes, and we worked together on this, and um, it's now a national landmark. And here's one example. This is a newspaper, um, the Daily News, from the day World War II officially ended. Hmm. And a few days before, they brought uh, reporters here and disclose the secret of radar. And they did that at other labs. And 
the uh, Daily News dedicated almost an entire page to it. And you'll see some quotes on the um, right-hand side that it was a laboratory victory that identify friend and foe that has been extended now that air traffic control helped win the war. It was scientific pioneers. And right in the middle, you see a picture of a radar unit at Camp Evans um, mm -hmm. out in the field. And that's one of the early radars. Camp Evans participated in the creation of many other radars. And they commissioned and funded many amazing laboratories like MIT's Rad Lab, like Harvard's uh, laboratory, like Bell Labs Radar Laboratory, mm. Western Electric, and their products were brought here to Camp Evans and saw that they met Army hardness and battle si survivability requirements. And then they put teams together to introduce them to the field, teams together to figure out how to repair them in the field, Built, um, wrote the manuals here because you couldn't go to uh, 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 you know, uh, Kinko's or someplace and have them written because there, <laughs> might, there might be a Nazi spy there. Oh, all yeah, right? yeah. So it was a soup the nuts ability to make secret devices from raw material to something to go to battle. Yeah. And on the, the right-hand bottom, you see a quote from the president, the battle laboratories held fateful risks for us, as well as the battles of the air, land, and sea. And now we've won those battles. And which president was that, Fred? Uh, Tr Truman. Thank oh. Yeah. I'm, uh, thanks for the quiz. <laughs> 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 All right. So it's a landmark for World War II, a major reason of victory radar. Okay. And here's an example. D-Day. Mm. We fooled, or the Allies fooled German radar. Okay. There were stories where they dropped um, miniature parachutists in another area. Um, they had put spies to feed German officers bad information. Mm -hmm. They let um, dead bodies with uh, fake plans off of submarines so they'd float into German-held beaches and that would feed them misinformation. But the Germans weren't worried because they had an excellent overlapping radar network and the unblinking eye of radar would say where the invasion was going to be. So two things were done to support the misinformation campaign. Is one, they sent planes, you see a picture of one in the middle, to fly up and down the French coast and identify where all the German radars were, what their frequency were, and they determined which ones they would bomb, which ones they would pretend to bomb, and because they wanted them to see things, right? Mm -hmm. And which ones, if they couldn't take them out of existence, jam them on a D-Day. And then they did one more step. They made radar generators. Hmm. So the full story was the attack on Normandy was going to be a fake to get Rommel's tanks to go to Normandy and the real evasion was going to occur in the area of Calais that's closest to the coast that made best logistical sense to get, you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of troops across in a, in a day. Right? Wasn't that a narrower part of the canal, the uh, channel rather? Yep, you are exactly correct. So it made sense. And, you know, we can make, I'm part German, so I can make a, that's the most economical, right? Uh, so, Here's the devices they made, radar multipliers. They actually had devices that would pick up German radar and send back a fake image that would make a few fishing boats look like a flotilla of battleships and support crafts. So the German radar was seeing a larger invasion fleet heading towards Calais than they saw off of Normandy. And that got them to hold back Rommel's tanks because 
His goal was to kill the landing on the beach. Hmm. And we made him go to the wrong beach. Yeah. So, and Camp Evans played a role in that. Okay. So now to protect the nation, and this is actually part of Camp Evans in World War II, that's the Project Diana site. There is a World War II series of radars. And, you know, if you laid awake at, at late at, or went, late at night and studied these things, you would actually see four or five different radar models here. Um, it was really a fun hunt to find the history because when we got the site here, all the information was removed and documents were destroyed. The secret documents were destroyed as per military require, or excuse me, the top secret documents. But the secret ones, luckily, a lot of them ended up in the National Archives. And we mined those and found a rich story that um, undergirded making it a national landmark. Okay, And they did things like the proximity fuse. This photo you're looking at is right out in Camp Evans. The happy story is where these devices are, a microwave radar, it's now a baseball field. So where the fate of nations were decided, kids are now doing the fate of baseball teams. Yeah, they're so, enjoying the life that there was given to them to defend to, to the, the country and the world. Th that is so true. And, and that's why, you know, hundreds of thousands of soldiers gave their lives to have a, a better future. And in our case, behind every soldier on the front, there were 10 people on the home front and Camp Evans represents the finest technical people on the home front, including persons of color. Mm. Camp Evans hired persons of color with technical backgrounds like physicists and mathematicians and chemists from the um, historical black colleges and universities. And this site became informally known as the Black Brain Trust. Mm. And um, that, that's an excellent, excellent story um, that um, one of our friends actually did a DVD from oral histories that he, that he, he did, okay? They did things like mortar counterfire. More of our American soldiers were killed on the um, islands of Iwo Jima and Guadalcanal by Japanese mortars than by bullets. And mm -hmm. An emergency, uh, General MacArthur put out emergency requests to the laboratories to get a radar that would tell them where to shoot back to take out the mortar things. Mm. And, uh, and one of the teams here said, whoa, uh, a Japanese radar, a common one, is this length? That happens to be perfect for the wavelength of our radar. They took one of these radar sets that you see on the screen with that amazingly complex tube that you see on the cover of Electronics Magazine, cover girl, cover tube. Um, they modified it, took it down to uh, Island Beach State Park, had captured Japanese mortars, were firing in the direction of the radar team, and they were having a level of success. And I got to do the lead of this team's oral history interview uh, Dr. John Marchetti, and um, he said that, you know, they were having having some success, but the radar pips should have jumped off the screen. And he goes, I'm in the history books. And he really is in the history books, the Army's official history of World War II, and this story is. But he goes, Ed Savini, he is not in the history books. And when we were out there, he goes, John, we are searching for the wings of aircraft. We're searching horizontally. These mortars are going vertically, vertically. And he took the radar screen and turned it 90 degrees. <laughs> That's so simple. Yep. And the indications, like he said, jumped right off the screen. When General MacArthur found that they actually not only had solved this problem, but they had a working prototype. He said, I need 25 of them immediately. 
and he was going to send General Stilwell from the Pacific Theater here to manage it because, you know, this is not a good thing. He goes, I can't depend on a bunch of engineers and scientists to get the job done. This needs military men, right? When they heard that, they said, we're not leaving. You get us food, you get us the parts, and you get us the, the teams that are going to go into the Pacific with them, and we will get the job done. And they stayed here for, I, I think it was eight days with only taking cat naps on cots. And then 25 sets were put on trucks with the train teams up to Newark airport and flown to the, um, where they were needed. And we believe they were used in a market garden, the uh, failed attempt to um, uh, infiltrate the Ruhr, like a second Normandy landing and they were definitely used in the Pacific. And one of the fun stories that uh, Dr. Marchetti um, related was after the war, he was here and a Marine um, uh, Colonel came here because he had searched him out because he wanted to shake the hands of the guy who's made that radar that saved his men from being killed by Japanese mortars. That's how much of a difference it made. So thus, oh, captured German uh, German radars, figuring out a way to jam them and nullify them, okay? Uh, saved many, many, many guys in the uh, Eighth Air Force, okay? Um, finding ways to shoot down. Um, I don't have a picture here. Oh, there's John Marchetti. Um, finding out ways to shoot down the V1s. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the V1 here. But the amazing thing about this is the day United States got into World War II on December 7th, Signal Corps radar spotted the Japanese planes 50 minutes before they dropped their first bomb. Hmm. Unfortunately, the Navy did not have the radar control room staffed, so the call went to a uh, guard. He picked up the phone and made the decision it must be uh, planes coming in from California and the, um, the time was lost, okay? And of course, the e World War II was ended with the atomic bomb through the luck of somebody mentioning to their son before they passed away then that the Signal Corps or Camp Evans had worked with Los Alamos on the atomic bomb triggers because they were radar triggers. Mm. We contact the Los Alamos and they confirmed that the quad, uh, quad redundant radars that set off the atomic bombs were developed in conjunction with Camp Evans and RCA, okay, oh, uh, down in Princeton. And the other thing they told us is that the test drops of atomic bombs without the nuclear uh, equipment in it, the dynamite was substituted instead was done in a practice range in South Jersey. Hmm. With all that land between here and there, they did it in South Jersey. Now it didn't say that this was to be near the radar experts who were part of the team, but I can jump there because um, you know I'm not a credentialed historian. I just play one when I'm here at Camp Evans. <laughs> okay, let's see. Do you got another question for I me? I do. What happened in World War One? Okay, w one of the fun things. Because this is like a puzzle. You have to go find the pieces. Hmm, yeah, because yeah, they're all over. So um, uh, when I worked for a mainframe manufacturer, uh, Amdahl Corp, um, they would send me out for three weeks stints to shake down uh, new introductions of hardware or um, work on different commands of Unix uh, on the mainframe. So it was a lot of fun. But on the weekends, I would be free and I would go up to the Stanford University archives and do research. And I looked up a book on, um, I think it was a guy named Ernst Alexanderson. And I'm going to go back here. And here's, here's his picture in the center, right? In his biography, or a history of him actually, the story was relayed by the author about what a fanatic guy this uh, Alexanderson was. He was here 
at Camp Evans when it was a Marconi transatlantic wireless station being run by the Navy as the central communication point between Washington and our American expeditionary forces in Europe, that he was working in the basement of the hotel, the building a few hundred feet from us, uh, and there happened to be a thunderstorm and he had headphones on. And even though they were grounded, one of the 400 foot antennas outside got hit by a bolt of lightning. And the, the author said he saw a spark jump from the headphones right into Alexanderson's head, right? Mm. And um, Alexanderson jumped up, said a few things, sat back down, put the earphones on and went right to work. <laughs> oh, all right. And for this, the, there was a, a, a footnote on this. For more details on this story and others, look up radio reminiscences by A. Hoyt Taylor. He was the commander of this facility during World War I, and we had no idea that this place was used in World War I and that it was the central communication point. So this was a super discovery. And along the way, there's been many angels that we've encountered and bad guys. Most of them are in green uniforms. But um, one of the angels was in the Navy uh, library. And um, when I, I couldn't find this book. So finally I said, he's a Navy officer. Let me try the Naval Research Laboratory, called up and they called back a few days later and said, we're sorry, we, we have the last copy and it's under glass and only our staff are allowed to touch it. And so, sorry, you can't see it. So I explained the situation and um, the lady said, I can't promise anything, but I'll see what I can do. And I've learned that when somebody says that, your results go up <laughs> real high. If somebody says, no problem, I got this, it's like, uh, all right, forget about it. Yeah. All right. So about a week later, an entire photocopy of the book showed up and there was a yes. chapter called Belmar yeah. and it talked about this place during World War I and that just opened our eyes. They even had a contingent of Marines protecting this facility because it was so important oh. to the World War I effort. And some of the first radio propaganda went through here. Uh, uh, President Wilson's 14 points that were um, broadcast without code. So German citizens who had wireless equipment, because this was new equipment then, not everybody had it. This yeah. was like uh, homebrew computer days, right? Could hear the president's points and that would stow civic civil unrest in Germany, which yeah, psychological warfare, right? Yeah, which yes. it, which it did, right? So amazing, amazing. Now, where did the messages come? If you see the uh, picture on your left, my right, I'm I'm all confused here. Uh, it says Wall, New Jersey. Look at the bottom. That's a horse and buggy, right? <laughs> And look at the size of the persons up, up uh, nearby the first antenna. Those were 400 foot antennas. There were six of them and they were made to capture messages sent from Carnarvon, Wales, right? And you see the map on top. That was the wireless girdle around the earth. And this place would have started work in 1914, but unfortunately, the war had started in Europe. The British seized the Carnarvon station because it was so strategic to be able to blast wireless messages in code to as far as the equipment would work, right? Um, now, one of the great inventors here, um, he started right before this station was going to go online. He was named Edwin Armstrong. And he um, was at Columbia University and he made an invention that revolutionized wireless and laid the foundation for commercial radio. Something else was needed, but that will come later, all right? This was called regeneration. 
feeding a tiny um, signal from what you'd pick up an antenna and boosting it mm. through electronics. And some people call this the birth of modern electronics. Done, again, done at Columbia University. Yes, I think there's something that we use called a repeater to, to boost signals. Yes. Same idea, yeah. all right? And he had invented this at Columbia University. Um, when Dr. No first came here, he, he was funded by the IEEE to pick a site related to Edwin Armstrong to make it a national landmark under the famous American inventors theme. And um, when he found out some of the unsavory past here, he closed his notebook and said, nope, we're not taking this any further. And he went to Columbia University and made that a national landmark, which was a good thing. But that invention was brought here, demonstrated to David Sarnoff. He was the Bill Gates of that day, right? He was the one who, even though he didn't invent the wireless music box, he got it into the public mind. But there was another problem here, and hopefully, didn't I Tarnoff found uh, he was the uh, founder of RCA, right? Or, or no? Who, who, where did we go after TCF? That was uh, right next door there. That was a Sarnoff. That was Sarnoff. That was RCA. Okay. Was that, it was previously RCA. RCA okay. And um, here's how RCA came about. And this may not be accurate, but you know how uh, somebody's trying to take over TikTok by buying, you know, forcing it to be sold its yes. American subsidiary. Yes. Yes. Well, at the end of World War One, the Navy wanted complete control of wireless and all its patents, so. They went to Congress and said, we want this. And Congress said, no, no, no. Wireless and this thing called radio is a commercial thing and it'll stay commercial. You butt out. Well, not to be told what to do by Congress, the Navy went and made a deal with companies like Westinghouse and General Electric and said, you like our fat Navy contracts? You buy out all of American Marconi's stock and we'll tell you what to do. <laughs> and when they bought out all the stock, they renamed that company Radio Corporation of America. Uh. And David Sarnoff, who was a manager and a very important person in Marconi American branch of wireless, he, he became a, um, a vice president. And um, a, another gentleman, I'm sorry, his name escapes me, his papers not Sarnos, but the other gentleman's papers are at Princeton University Library at the Firestone Library. And um, he, another person was the first president RCA, but then Sarnoff, who was a great at self-promotion, he became the second president of RCA and was the figurehead of the company. Um, people recognized, the only thing that recognized him more was the, um, the, the, the dog. Now, so, so you want to talk about the Marconi days? Yeah, perfect. Now, here's what happened that made wireless able to go to radio. During the war, or in original, the reason you couldn't use wireless, and you'll if you Google on the internet, you'll see people who said, oh, in 1900-so, we, we broadcast radio on the wireless. And they feel that they did that first and they invented that. But the reality was that old fashioned circuitry, just like static and old uh, computer circuits, anytime there was lightning or a sunspot, the old circuitry picked up that static. Hmm. And there were times, and there's uh, station logs from this facility on file at the Smithsonian that they drowned out the, the Morris code for as long as eight hours, okay? And the best time is when you were at night when the sun energy, those particles coming from the sun weren't hitting the atmosphere and creating fake radio waves picked up as static. This gentleman, Roy Wengant on your uh, screen invented static elimination hmm. between here and another site in North Jersey and when he had it perfected, he invited Mr. Marconi to come and see it. Mr. Marconi was at uh, Hoboken at the time, 
And in a book at, at Princeton that never got published, he goes, you know, so many people have told me that they've solved this problem. I'll go down to the Belmar station just to humor Mr. Wagant because, you know, he's that important. Well, he came here, they put headphones on him and he heard, he heard, he flipped it on and the static like blasted his earphones. And in the account, Mr. Marconi threw the headphones down and gave Wagant a dirty look, right? And when goes, no, no, put him back on, put him back on, right? <laughs> so Marconi puts him back on and he switches on his new device and out of the static, you hear perfectly clear wireless. Mm. So now you could talk on the wireless mm. and you could sing on the wireless. So you know how history repeats itself? Remember in the early days of the internet? Yeah. You could Google and you could find real information and you didn't see ads. Yeah. Well, now that you can talk and sing on the wireless, you could now have commercials mm. and the money poured in <laughs> and an industry was born. All That's right. Funny. So, you know, I, I kid my grandkids that I'm old enough to been part of the enjoyed the Internet and they have to suffer with the ad on it. All right. All right. So one more question. Uh, how did Camp Evans open the space age communications? All right. At this site, see that large antenna there? The, the war is over. And a, a, um, a team is put together to pierce the ionosphere because the whole Marconi network was based on, let's get back bouncing radio waves off the ionosphere. So the basic feeling was we were in a, a, an atmospheric bubble that pre prevented us from communicating out of space, right? Well, with the right energy level, right frequency, you could pierce the ionosphere, but nobody believed it. And they took a special microwave FM radar that Edwin Armstrong did, Mr. Radio Regeneration, Mr. FM Radio, super inventor, brought it down from his um, facility at Alpine, New Jersey, reinstalled it in one of these buildings, and they were able to bounce a signal off the moon on January of 1946 that proved you could do communications in space, right? And the history didn't end, okay? They had Cold War stuff here. They brought V2 scientists. They brought the Nazi radar and communication scientists over here. They did a Cold War listening for atomic tests underground and made devices detect um, nuclear isotopes in the atmosphere that would blow away. Oh, here's Project Diana. And one of the fun things along here is this is Dr. McAfee with an army general at one of the anniversaries and to be a scientist uh, and a person of color was unheard of in World War II in 1946. So um, he was an early member of the National Association of Black Physicists and um, working with Congressman Smith, the post office that delivered his mail is now named in his honor, okay? And uh, through that work and it entertains me uh, I was invited the um, to join the National Society of Black Physicists, so it's that entertains me to no end. Um, so uh, it's Joe McCarthy came here, mm. and what he did here was so outrageous it ended his career. And Jeff, my timer went to sleep. Where am okay. I? All right. So Chris, do we have any questions? Uh, we don't have a question. There's one comment, comment uh, that, uh, that, you know, you know it's, it's basically, made. I'm going to paraphrase, bless but any guy who is so excited to try to pack, pack all this history in 30, 30 minutes. minutes. You're, you're trying, trying to get more out of supplies and possibly cash. Your enthusiasm is appreciated. So, right. no question. So, if you want, you can finish the remaining time. Um, you can have about another eight minutes. We can, you can, you can tell us a little bit more about the history. Okay. A little more. Yeah. Watch the clock. Cause I'll go right. for hours. I'm watching the clock. All right. 
This is another amazing thing. And the dish that you see in here, the large one that these um, generals and um, Dr. Zalin standing in front of it, is still exists and it is working today. And yeah. students from Princeton University are studying pulsars with it, right? But it's not just any old 1957, 60 foot dish. It actually, if you watch the Weather Channel or bring up um, a, a, a radar, weather radar app on your phone, mm -hmm. it can trace its lineage to this dish because this is the dish that um, the satellite in the center, the experimental uh, Tyro satellite, sent the first images from space to this dish. It was developed in the building that you see in the center interior pictures, the lower pictures. It worked perfect, even though they did it on April 1st. <laughs> right? April Fool's Day. And, yeah. and those of you who've watched late night documentaries, you've seen that in the early uh, space launches, they had launch after launch blow up. Okay. Yeah. And even one of those vanguards that you see bouncing in the, in the flames before it disappears, parts of that were done in secret at Camp Evans. But putting that aside, you have to be, you know, waiting for the press to eat you alive because the press always did that, not just today, to do a launch on April 1st. And the reason they did it is because the first weather map was published in London in, I want to say, 1885. I have the year wrong. But if this worked and these photographs were able to be developed and everything worked and it was all experimental, you would have auto magic weather maps. Hmm. And what a boon to weather prediction and mankind. And the extra bonus was a few days after it was launched, they spotted a hurricane. Yeah, and it was like, who, what happened there? There was the president, which was, who was the president? Um, it was Eisenhower. And then how did it happen that he, they, they gave him this, this, this they looked at it and what did they see? They, they, what did they think it was? Um, well, they saw the eye and they were sort of, you know, people knew about the eye of the hurricane because if you've ever had the eye go over you, which we have here, one year it happened at Camp Evans, um, the wind's going one way, it's nasty as things are getting knocked over. It gets quiet for, depending on how large they are, and then the wind goes the other direction. So they knew there was an eye, but they couldn't imagine you could see it from space. So when they saw that first hurricane, it was a revelation and hurricane tracking was born down the street here at Camp Evans. <clears throat> and before that, the first photograph taken was given to a helicopter pilot just in the large parking lot, he flew it to a nearby airport where a jet, a fighter jet was waiting. They handed him the photograph. It was uh, flown down to Edwards Air Force Base, zipped over to the White House, and they handed it to President Eisenhower three hours after it was developed that same day because it was such a leap in science. Okay. Wow. And again, and it's thrilling that thanks to the Princeton Physics Department, who pushed about $50,000 into getting this baby working again, it is not only a, a giant artifact that you can't put in a display case, it is now, again, a tool of science. All right. They did nuclear research here. Hmm. Okay. They had a 25-foot deep um, uh, containment vessel, not a reactor, and the team from Camp Evans learned about electromagnetic um, pulse of an atomic bomb. And this is one of the areas where they learn how to harden communication circuits from that pulse. Okay? What does hardening mean? It means if a burst of energy comes from an atomic blast, and in you know at the 1950s and 60s, we were worried that the Soviets were going to do an air burst over um, cities, oh, yeah. and that would knock out all the communications networks to like counterattack. Like something like that. Yep. Okay. And so here at this old Marconi station, this World War I site, this World War II site, they were effectively preparing for the Cold War. And sometime when you look at uh, up, up this one gray uh, photograph or black and white photograph, you see a World War II weasel. Um, 
if you pair this up with a late night documentary uh, when you can't sleep, they'll talk about the first atomic bomb tests after the war where the scientists in Nevada are trying to learn about this and they'd go out and lead line tanks. Well, after a while, they realized that that really wasn't good because they didn't have air filtration systems on their tanks and stuff like that. So they developed a remote controlled weasel. Why a weasel? Because that was the World War II name of that kind of device that could uh, uh, go onto a landing beach and had treads. And in the World War II electronics, look at the size of the antenna, 12 foot antenna. The idea was at the test site, they would have the weasel in a hardened bunker. As soon as the bomb blew up, it, the thing would, through radio control, would zip out and look for short-term isotopes that their half-life would have them disappear in a few hours. Mm. Okay, so all in the names of physics fun. And look at the bottom center photo. Um, the, um, it looks like hier hier hieroglyphics. Sir. Yep, as, as a laugh. Uh, they thought their underground um, open air t uh, chamber looked like a, an e Egyptian tomb. Yeah. And um, the uh, scientist, his name escapes me, which uh, bothers me. Uh, he had a relative who was into Egyptology. And as a joke, he painted this and it became uh, world famous among physicists. Okay. So... Oh, oh, there oh. we go. The most important part. Moby oh. Dick. Tell me about Moby Dick. What? What is, what is that? How does it relate to computer technology? Well, it's it's one of the great granddaddies of mobile computing, and uh, the the inside story was that one of the units here wanted to buy a computer for their purposes, and the budget office said, "Sorry, no no money for computers. Too bad." Okay, and you know, bureauc bureaucrats, they don't care. And for some reason they couldn't do the politics to order them to find money. But there was a lump of money for mobile army field equipment. So they bought the mainframe of their dreams and a tractor trailer and put the mainframe in the, uh, uh, you know, in the trailer. And you remember the story about IBM and the seven dwarfs? Well, yes. one of the dwarfs was Sylvania. So that was the main contractor at the time. Mm -hmm. And they jokingly lined up the name so it worked out to be Moby Dick. <laughs> so it was uh, creative funding procurement, I guess, or however you want to word that. Yes, it was. And the lore is that, you know, when the laughter died down or the anger went away from the accounting people, <laughs> um, they had to do the standard mobile army field tests and the urban legend is, whether it's true or not, is that the computer worked fine, but the truck broke down because the computer was overweight for the truck. Wow. Okay. So that's Moby Dick. And it created, they created a thing called field data for it. And what's field data? Field data was building upon a, a communications code for early radar systems out in the field to get their data back with a code that was reliable that had a level of, of error correction um, to that level of processor, be it mechanical, you know, electromechanical, or later um, vacuum tube computers. So as I understand it, field data was a precursor to ASCII code. So it was a standard symbolic code where you can exchange it between different computers because in those days every computer was unique there was no standards every you couldn't communicate so that was a way to share data with different computers yes yes isn't that great yes and we have a model of this moby dick in the vcf museum and courtesy of chm computer history museum we have a video that has video details of moby dick yep um so one, 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 one more. more. I got to do thing. one more. One more thing. Now, okay. there was this professor um, who was at Ursinus College, and then he went to U of P. And as a professor, and I get to see the Princeton, you have to find money for projects to fund your a group of graduate students and postdocs and all that. So they're like little, little tribes of invention or innovation, right? So while at U, U of P, um, Professor Malkley or Dr. Malkley picked up a contract 
to analyze radar coverage diagrams because Camp Evans wanted to know where did radar energy go at this distance, at that further distance, and it was a whole bunch of simple but hundreds of thousands of calculations, and he realized that he could conscript every computer person with a calculator called a computer at the U of P, and he couldn't fulfill his contract. So for years in his head, he had bouncing around the idea of making an electromechanical computer system, a system to replace the computers, and now he had the motivation. So in a oral history that he did at the Smithsonian, he said that that project was the inspiration for getting his ideas out of his head and onto paper because he, he thought the army would fund it to get their radar coverage diagrams. And his fellow professors um, looked at him and said, no, 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 the army's not gonna fund that. When you go to the army funding board and you say radar coverage diagram, you're gonna get the hook. Let's figure out something your machine do that they'll pay for. And that was gun firing tables. When you get a brand new gun and you can cast the barrel with the same um, molten metal on the same day with the same mold one after another, and you take it out to a test range, when you fire that shell, it will not go to the same spot as the gun made five minutes before. So they have to take them out to a test field, see where they shoot and do every permutation of uh, humidity, wind speed, and they create this big fat table. So during World War II, guns would sit in the field longer than they wanted them to, waiting for the gun firing table calculations to be done. And that was the promise that led to the funding of ENIAC. Awesome. I, yeah. I give up. Well, thank okay. you, Fred. I mean, we could like, talk for like hours. So well, there, there is a question. If, if, one question then. It's a maybe, it's a maybe question because okay. you know, may or may not want to elaborate on the uh, rest of the anecdote about Senator McCarthy. Okay. Senator McCarthy got bogus information that there was a spy cell um, acting in West Germany or East Germany, and they could get documentation out of Camp Evans at their will. Okay, I didn't, I didn't think they used the term on demand, but it was sort of like that. And the FBI had investigated and found out that the spy was lying. He did actually have a manual, top secret manual from Camp Evans on a microwave radar, but we gave the Soviets the manual, the radar, and trained them on how to use it. Because as Machiavelli would say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Mm. And the Soviets were our friends. So the story was debunked, but somehow McCarthy didn't care about that. He just heard Tom Sell and Camp Evans, and he put a fact-finding team of uh, congressmen together, and they came here, and we have pictures of him. Unfortunately, the sound was lost on the video, walking out of the parking lot to the front of the Mark Money Hotel, walking up to the, the step of the hotel, but there's pictures of him in the lounge, and pictures of him at the front gate. And when he came to a nuclear detection project and he was already pre-ticked off because he had reporters with him and people without top secret clearance. And when you're elected to, Cong elected to Congress, you get top secret clearance. Isn't that scary? Um, but anyway, putting that aside, the when he would come through with his entourage, people would lock documentation away and close things because that was the rules. And for some reason that annoyed him. Hmm. And when he got into this project in a small building that's still here, building 9400, where they had computers, not computers, because they weren't up Person, to this. people instead of machines. Right. Computers were pe people, computers or machines. When data would come in from clandestinely hidden devices that would pick up seismic vibrations from underground so Soviet nuclear tests, that data would be crunched into where the test was, 
and how powerful it was. So we knew if we had the uh, biggest firecrackers on the block and McCarthy was shown that and he came out and said, this should be declassified. Let the reporters in where this should go to the public. And you, you, the, the army decides what's top secret and secret. And this broke the rules and the guards inside armed guards said, sir, you can't order us to let people without clearance in the building. I don't care. I'm a member of Congress. And we interviewed one of the guys and he said, what do I do? Shoot a reporter or somebody or get course marshaled, uh, go to Levensworth and my family starves. Right. But luckily the congressman backed down. Right. And a fellow with him, I, I want to say Roy Cohen, swore to get vengeance on the army. Well, the army was so annoyed that they used politics to get the army McCarthy hearings. They say it's the first reality television, but they destroyed McCarthy on public TV. But if you buy that, uh, I bought it as a VHS tape, right? And listen to it. You can hear McCarthy go, if you only knew what's going on in our secret. And um, the fellow who sort of, uh, prosecuting him shouts him down because even though everybody knew this was the radar laboratory it wasn't big on the you know public thing public the, awareness right? right so that's the mccarthy story all right well thank you fred i mean there's a lot of history here um you people can come here to camp evans and infrawage science and history museum um there's a lot of different exhibits and museums here world war ii history uh, antique radio, shipwreck museum, electronic warfare is a very interesting one. So um, I encourage people to come and visit. We're open Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday, 1 to 5 p.m. Pay admission and come in, support our museum. It's great. And I really appreciate you coming in. And finally, you can tell our vintage computer audience some history of Camp Evans. Thanks, Jeff. It was my pleasure. You're welcome.